There's something to ponder. Never would have heaven might have a downside. Many years ago, somebody said to me, you know, Pastor Paul, I, I, I understand heaven and I look forward to being there, but isn't it going to get boring after a while? Come on, some of you have thought about that, right? Like, what do we do after all that time, right? You thought about that? Or, um, so that question, what do they do all, what do you do all the time when you're in heaven? Apparently, according to Revelation, you spend a lot of time singing. Um, and Anthony asked me to emphasize that so that if you want to start practicing, you can join the choir and they'll be more than happy to have you getting ready, prepping for heaven. Choir is a heaven prep course. So lots of singing. Um, and um, the other thing that some people have raised as a concern, and we see this certainly in our reading from Revelation today, is that isn't it crowded up there? And it is getting crowded in there, right? What did we hear? Last week, in our reading from Revelation, we heard that around the throne were the four living creatures. This is John's vision of heaven, right? There are four living creatures, and there were 24 elders, and then there were a whole mess of angels up there around the throne. So that's pretty crowded. And then John says today, in his vision, he says, there is a multitude that no one could count around the throne. So there's this huge crowd that nobody can even count. They're so vast. They're so huge. Such a great number of people gathered around the throne. You can, so here's the throne room. It's getting crowded in there. But there's this multitude of people. And John says they're from every language, every nation. All peoples are gathered there around the throne um, praising God. So there's this huge, huge, uncountable number of people up there in heaven. And how are you going to find anybody? Right? Ever think about that? How are you going to find the one that you love, right? No, you didn't think, right, because you weren't worried about that, right? No, you're not worried about that. It's going to work out, right? I think um, there's something to remember about John's vision, right? Something very important to remember. We'll have a, a, a moment here. And that is that John's vision is a vision for his time and his experience and the experience of, of other Christians, and it's not, it's not a blueprint. In other words, heaven may be like everything that John says it is in Revelation, and it may be very different, but what John is seeing is a vision that helps to encourage him in his life of faith. So he gets this vision of what God wants John to know as he struggles to be a faithful follower of Jesus in his day and time. And the reality of heaven may be very different than that. We don't know. Um, Jesus never gave details about what heaven would be like. Not, not many details about that. Um, but we just know that that's the destiny and that's the future that awaits us. And, and in John's picture this morning, he pictures this great crowd. And one of the, one of the elders asks him, John, who are these people? And John says, um, sir, you know. Right? That was a good answer. You know. Um, and the elder says to him, these are those who have come out of the great ordeal and washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb so that they're now white. Now, it's a couple things important to remember about that story. We often think that who the people that John is seeing in this vision of his are martyrs, but that's not necessarily true. The blood that they wash their robes in is not their own, it's the blood of the Lamb. In other words, this is very symbolic in Revelation, it's the blood of Jesus. It's his sacrifice for us. So what these elders, um, what these who have come out of the great ordeal, how did they get to wear white robes? It's because of their relationship to Jesus and not necessarily martyrdom. It's because they identify themselves as followers of Jesus. And, and that's how they get that status as wearing those white robes. Um, it's because Jesus gave himself for them and they know it. So um, that's how they get to be there wearing those white robes. And um, it's also indicated that they came out of the great ordeal. Now, I, I just want to warn you, okay, if you're thinking of doing a little research on this on your own, 
you, you need to come and talk to me afterwards because you just just do a Google search on the word tribulation. There's a rabbit hole. You may never come back out of that one. Um, so don't don't get too caught up on what you read on the internet about the significance of the book of Revelation because it could really throw you for a loop. Um, you may never, like I said, you may never get back out. But the ordeal, what is the ordeal that, that John sees in that vision? The ordeal is this. Not church, I mean life. The ordeal is life. The ordeal is our day-to-day -day existence that, that we're called to live mindful of our relationship to God in Christ. And, and that's not always easier. Sometimes that's all the ordeal we can handle, right? It's that, that calling to us to be faithful, to be mindful, to be disciples in the midst of our experience of life, of its ups and downs, to, to hold on to that one essential reality to which Jesus refers in that reading from John in which he says, my sheep hear my voice and they belong to me and no one, no one can take them away from me. No one, he says, can snatch them out of my hand because my loving caress of my people is stronger than anything. Right? Jesus, the mighty destroyer of death, who does that for our sake because of his deep and abiding love for us. And in the midst of the sometime ordeal of life, Jesus is the one who promises to walk through that with us and we believe that that happens, right? We believe that that happens, but what we're called upon as God's people is to immerse ourselves in that reality through prayer, through worship, through mindfulness of God's presence, to keep the faith, in other words, even in the midst of the harshest circumstances, to keep the faith and to have a vision for that future that God has prepared for us. Now, oftentimes, Christians have been accused of... Um, hoping for pie in the sky by and by when you die, right? That'll, it's, life may be miserable now, but it's going to get better. So we, we are sometimes seen as Christians as people who we're all full of anticipation, um, and the reality may not match the anticipation. And, and I, don't, I don't think that that's at all what John is talking about in the book of Revelation. It's certainly not what the psalm is talking about. You love, you love that psalm, Psalm 23? Isn't it a great psalm? It's such a wonderful psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. There's nothing that I need. God is my shepherd. Even in the midst of need, there's nothing that I need because I have God, and God will take care of all that is lacking in my experience, even in the midst of the lack. It's, it's one of those paradoxes of our faith that um, Paul says that, my strength is made perfect in weakness because when I realize I can only go so far, God makes up the difference even before I know that there's a difference to be made up. That wonderful witness that people of faith understand that when life is an ordeal, as it often is, God is present in it. And can we take a step back for a moment and allow ourselves to be open to that divine presence so that we, like John, have confidence even in the midst of the most challenging circumstances in our lives. So our faith is not about what might happen later on, someday, in heaven, in another place, in another time. Our faith is about the reality of that other place and other time breaking into our current experience and giving us perspective on that which is temporary from the point of view of that which is permanent. In other words, heaven is already our inheritance. Knowing that, it changes the way we live. Or, or let's look at this through an image that might be a little bit more accessible. If you knew that you had a rich uncle who was um, well up there in years, and you were absolutely certain that this rich uncle was going to leave you millions of dollars, when would you start to spend it? Yes, exactly. Before he was even cold, he'd be like, oh man, I got millions of dollars coming. I can, I can do this. It's going to work out. I've got, I've got all this rich inheritance coming to me. I don't have to worry about tomorrow because Uncle Jerome is going to leave me millions of dollars. So I'm going to be fine. And we let the reality of the future change the living of the present. 
Why, that's what John's vision is all about. The reality of the future, that no one can snatch you out of God's hand, affects your living of the present. That you're living that, that reality now. That God isn't waiting until you die to do something beautiful for you. That God is already doing that. That that reality is already a part of your life. And if that's true, if you've already gotten the inheritance you have, then how then shall we live? How do we walk in that reality? Does faith become that primary way of seeing that informs the way we live? Well, yes, on our good days, right? We all know that that walk of faith can be a bit of a challenge and a bit of a struggle, and sometimes faith is strong and sometimes faith is weak. But the reality is still God's reality that reaches down into our current experience, right? The Lord is my shepherd. Even when I feel like I'm adrift, God is still my shepherd, and I don't need anything because of that reality. And I think sometimes our whole our whole goal as followers of Jesus is to begin to is to experience that reality over and over and over again. So that when when that eventuality of heaven comes, it's not a surprise or a shock. It's something that we've already experienced. I already experience it. I experience it right here with all of you. This is a glimpse of heaven. I certainly hope you like everybody around you. Because <laughs> this is eternity. This is a glimpse of heaven given to us. This time of worship. This gathering around this meal. We call this a foretaste of the feast to come. A shadow of what will be. But a reaching down of God into our midst even now. To give us an idea of what heaven would be like. This holy community. Blessed by God's presence and one another. Blessed by everyone who comes here to sing, to pray, to share love and concern for one another, to hear the voices of children. And, and the, the wonderful thing is that when you think about, you know, that, that concern that heaven might be boring. Do you, you ever get bored hearing Anthony play? Sure. I never get bored of that. No, no. Right? He could, you could just keep playing and playing. Um, well, that's kind of a glimpse of heaven, right? You ever get bored hearing me preach? Never mind. We're going to move on to the next topic. Here. Um, but, but, but this is the reality that we then carry with us into our lives. It, it's, it's not just a time out of time, but it's a time that determines and focuses our time. This experience of worship, of joy, of, of community together. Of, of care and, and love for one another, which we believe God freely gives to us, of, of reaching out to those who hurt in our midst to let them know that they're not alone, of sharing that compassion, because we are all in the hands of God. So, that vision that John has, right, that beautiful, beautiful vision of this uncountable multitude, um, just singing God's praises, right? Praising God anyway, because they've been through the ordeal, is what we experience here in worship, what we experience together as community, what we are invited to bring into this experience, but then to bring out into our experience with other people in the world. And my feeling is that many of you probably first got an inkling of that when you were little babies and your mother held you in her arms and um, there's really that reality of a sense of, of safety, of peace, of, uh, can you imagine anybody ever snatching you out of your mother's arms? No, right? So there's another image for us today on this Mother's Day, on this fourth Sunday of Easter, that we are safe in God's arms and we carry that reality with us even through the ordeals of life to be that transformative power in the world. <laughs> that vision becomes reality. God with us, Emmanuel. And there's nothing, nothing that we want. Amen. Amen.